Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Pop Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their email inboxes as soon as we hit publish, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, directly and that even includes me, which, hey, I think I'd want to do that. Of course, I'm me. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links that you're going to find in the show notes. Today, I am very, very honored to be speaking with the inimitable Wynn Charles. Hi, Wynn. Hi. Thank you for having me on. Oh my gosh, I saw... Let me do the intro, because Wynn is an award-winning author, a podcaster and an advocate for people with disabilities, also a competitor in the Kona Ironman Triathlon. Blows my mind. Her memoir, a book named I Win, is proof that really nothing truly can hold us back when we are as committed as you are. So let me start from the very beginning. Can you just tell me like, how your life, when it first started being affected by any kind of disability? Okay. So for those of you who've hung around me long enough, know my work, um, you know that I have cerebral palsy. But for those of you who don't know me from all in all, um, don't know that I have cerebral palsy. And I, cerebral palsy is a lack of oxygen injury at birth. At, uh, I got it at 27 weeks. Um, oh, one pound, 13 ounces. So I didn't really get affected by it. I wouldn't say um, I got affected by cerebral palsy. It came to me because of my premature birth. I see. I I didn't realize it was a it was an a lack of oxygen. That's a it. It, it is. And kids okay. can get it when they have strokes in the womb, when they mm. have strokes outside the womb, when mm. the umbilical cord is wrapped around their neck. And so that's why nurses and doctors are so fearful of umbilical cords being wrapped around kids' necks, babies' yeah. necks, because of lack of oxygen. Yeah, that's that's um thank you for that. I appreciate the explanation. That being said though, looking at everything you've done, I mean, you've written t at least two books that I know of. There are more, I think, right? There are cool. two that I found. There um there are 12 books I'm 12. working on, No, there are 11 books published. I'm working on my 12th, my 13th, oh my, my 14th. That's amazing. When so, thir 14 books, 14, um, you've got your own podcast, injure, injure a community advocate, plus the Ironman triathlon. I mean, listen, like the best way I can say this is that the word disability just plain doesn't apply to you. Eh, well, it does. <laughs> the word disability does, but I don't get it. I don't want it stoppy. I take challenges head on. Yes. There was a quote that I found, actually. Um, I think it was on your profile that says, um, you advocate living a full life no matter what holds you back. Yeah. And I, st I think you've nothing has held you back. No. I mean, it's stunning. Yeah. I, it most is. people don't write 14 books, you know. <laughs> well, I'm working on my 12th book, my sultan's book, my fortune's book. I just need to get the finances to do it. In the moment I say that publicly, yeah, I just need to get the finances to do it. And so, and that's fine. It takes, it takes a person forever to write one book. And for me, it, because I use speech dictation, it takes mm -hmm. a little bit longer and the speech dictation is a mess. 
when I hand it to an editor, but editors tend to work with me and tend to mm-hmm. get to know me, and they work with my mess. They make it beautiful. So um, that's why. And I am gay. I know that a lot of your listeners are in the LGBTQ plus community. Yes, you can at me for getting the letters wrong. I am gay. I came out gay. I came out to my stepmom at the time. Um, and we'll get into why I had a stepmom and why. I came out to my stepmom at the time after my father died because mm. he was homophobic. Oh, gosh. He All right. was homophobic. No, that's okay. And... Um, that's one of the bigger fight, the smaller fights that he and my stepmom had because um, she was totally cool with gay people. And I, I said, I have something to tell you. I told her. She said, I love you no matter what. So it's like, That's yeah. Good. But <laughs> I was afraid of. My dad, my dad was homophobic. People that are close to me knew that. And people that are listening to this interview now know that. And um, when this interview comes out in May, they will know why I didn't come out until 2019. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Because I was afraid that... um, my own father would disown his child and not take yeah. care of me. And I needed care due to my disability. Now, oh. do I walk into the hospitals and say I'm gay? No, because I need care. <laughs> sure. But imagine, so, I mean, you're, you're, hoping for, you're hoping for support from your family and you... you held back who you are to not even to protect them, but to protect yourself. I mean, it's, it's, that's horrible. Yeah. And no, that was just the cake and the icing wasn't even on top of it. I got emotionally (laughs) and physically abused by a family member, by my mom's sister who emotionally and physically abused me because she didn't like my care after my dad died and so and my family knows I'm my mom's family knows I'm gay my dad's family knows I'm gay and so that wasn't me being gay didn't bring on the emotional and physical abuse but me being disabled brought on the physical and emotional abuse and 85% of women with Disabilities. Eighty-five percent of all disabled people are some sort of abuse because really? it's the um, the disabled get targets as abuse because we can't move, we can't fend for ourselves, we can't move, oh, gosh. and so therefore, and what I've learned over the years is it's highly unlikely that women will abuse other women, but it's common. So, um, and what I've learned over the years is that the abuser won't let the abusee go get help, in general, whether you're disabled or not. As this whole thing happened, and I knew that I was abused, so as this whole thing happened, I'm like, now what does a man Zoe Ponda do when she's abused? Do I call adult protective services? Because anyone could call adult protective services. By the way, a man Zoe Ponda is a counselor, a priest, a social worker, depending on the case, and a teacher. All teachers are man Zoe and so I, how I got my mandatory reporter training was 
I was a teacher, and that's how I got it. And basically what a mandatory reporter does in a kid's sense is say if a kid comes to the classroom and he has bruises all, he or she has bruises all over them and is actually really weird and saying, mommy hit me, you're supposed to call child, you're supposed to call child protective services as a mandatory reporter. So I was just explaining that to your audience so they know what a mandatory reporter is. So she put, my abuser put me in a really hard place because I'm like, do I call? Or as the disabled woman here and do the boy that cried wolf? I didn't want to sound like the boy that cried wolf because I didn't want Colorado, the state of Colorado, knowing this too. And anyway, the state of Colorado found out anyway. So what I I did is I walked away and I walked up my stairs and then I, I almost said, I don't want to go to dinner with you guys. Mind you, I went to dinner with them and they were still mean to me. And I had to and in a public setting, and then the the next week, I went to counseling, and the counselor said again, "Do you feel safe at home?" And I said, "Yes, but this is what's going on. This is what went on, and this is what went on." So. We finished our session, and this thing is fine. I finished my session with the counselor after saying all that. And I was by myself. Uh, aid wasn't pleasant in the counseling session because I wanted the counseling sessions to be private the, as much as they could be, even though my mom and my aide went in the... When I first started counseling, they went in to talk to the counselors and say all this nasty. Well, the aide didn't say anything. Natalie said um, all this nasty stuff about me and gave, they gave me her, they gave her my background. So basically, I have a disability and this is why we want to send Wynn to counseling. My stepmom said, you need to go to counseling now. Basically yelled at me, yelled at me, yelled at the aide, you need to go to counseling now. And then uh, it was a whole mess after my dad died. So uh, my counselor said, do you feel safe at home? I said, yes, but this is what went on. And she, I, after I left, picked up the phone. Adult Protective Services was right next to her office. There was a um, lobby, and then a, you would walk out like you were going to the bathroom and going downstairs to the outside, and then Adult Protective Services was right next to her office, presently. And she knows to call without protective services when anyone says something weird because she's a mandatory reporter herself. So what I did is told her that's a mandatory reporter because I'm like, she has to report it. Either, either I'm going to report it or she's going to report it. It was that way. And so the next thing I know, I go to counseling that next week. I feel better because I've reported it to her, and so she knows what's going on. And that next week, I walk out of counseling to not seeing my aide. Now, granted, I know how to get to my aide's car. I know how, I know if she's in the bathroom, she'll come back. I know if she's making a phone call, she'll text me. and meet me on stairs. So my thought is, I look for my aide, she's normally sitting in the lobby. I thought, well, maybe she's in the bathroom. Maybe she went down to her car to make a phone call. I'll just start 
walking that way and we'll meet in the hallway and everything will be done. And then a stranger to me says to me, are you looking for your aid? And I said, yes, I am. But I, it wasn't like I was confused as to where she was. And so the stranger said to me, well, your aid's in adult protective services giving us. And my brain goes, quick, quick. And so they sat me down and said, when? We need you to do a professional interview. And for those of you that do not know what a professional interview is, it's when um, a, prof a professional interviewer sits you down, has you recap everything that went on, and the DA and the cops are sitting again sitting in another room, but listening to what you say and the professional interview. They have this for kid. they have this for kids, they have it for adults too, me being the adult. And I thought, when I went down to get my professional interview, I thought, man, I can't imagine what kids have to do in this. I still can't right. imagine what the kids feel about this because they need a witness statement from the kids. And sometimes it's drawing pictures and sometimes it's talking. In the meantime, as all this is going on, a friend calls me who's, who I'm really close to. And she goes, when I am coming in to Aspen, I want to see you. And so I make a This was a week before this all went down. So I make arrangements to see the friend. Sure. Well, the day this all went down, I called my friend. I was sitting in my living room and said, you know what? I need to cancel my appointment with you, cancel seeing okay. you, I will tell you what's going on when I can because it's major. And I, she goes, okay, now I'm not the type of person to cancel on people, especially sure. when they're coming in to town, into town. So I'm not the type of person to cancel. And this friend knows that. But this friend also knew that I had a disability. She was watching my life on the outside. So therefore, and she knew my dad died, and she was watching all this stuff on the outside. So therefore, and we, we were talking every single day. We still talk to this day. And so therefore, she said, okay, I'll just keep you in prayer. That's literally all she said. And I'll wait for the next phone call. And so, because I knew if I was seeing this person, I knew that I was going to burst into tears in her arms. Sure, And sure. I knew that I couldn't control what was going on with her. And there are certain people that I can't control. She's one of them. And so, basically, it's, it went, okay, it went my aunt, my self, my stepsister, and then it gets to my stepmom. Well, my stepmom says, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do this? And the cops came to my house for her witness statement. And she goes, why do I have to do this? Like, before the cops show up. And in my driveway. And I said, because I am the one that said, because you witnessed someone getting emotionally and physically abused. You were there, even if it was at the tail end. You witnessed, um, may I am being extremely mean and may I am emotionally and physically abusing a person. You, 
the person that you were helping to take care of. And even my aide said why, she said, she steps, even my aide steps right up some light and did it. She had no doubt in her mind. And sure. um, so, and this story gets even better if you guys think this is not good enough already. Well, this story gets I'm, even better. And so, I mean, it's because um, it's been five years now, right? That was 2019, yeah, you 19. said. It's so it's been, been five, I mean, you moved, you said you've moved states. I've moved which states. Which is good. And so, this did it story, blow up that badly? What? Did it blow up that badly that you had to move? Ah, uh, yeah, pretty out much. Of st- it blew up that badly that I. Oh had my moved. gosh! I had to move because of financial reasons and better quality okay. life. I couldn't keep my dad's house, so but okay. it blew up that badly, and so that's why they had the custody case over me, because yeah. that's why my family. I found out why, and my mo- my. And who was my abuser's accomplice uh, um, sidekick? She she said, "Well, if you touch Win or do something to this house, I'll come out and fix it." And so then I get a call from my lawyer, say from my lawyer, saying that my aunt has hired a attorney. I'm thinking, oh boy. And yeah. I thought the attorney was going to be over the phone. I thought it was just going to be my aunt and my attorney. I'm like, oh boy, that's bad enough. But then my family decides to fly out all my family, including oh my, my abuser, decides to fly out to the court to the court appearance. To try and get custody out of me, I step off an elevator and see my lawyer and my stepmom's lawyer and my family's lawyer. Oh, I don't know how I'm talking about the case. And um, yeah. and um, my lawyer looks at me and says, "When do you, you know your family's in there, right?" You know your mom's family's in there, right? I'm like, oh, no. I said, I looked into her straight in the face, and I said, no. No, I didn't know that my mom's family was in there. Right. And I said to her, is there a person named Marianne in that um, courtroom? And she goes, yes. And I said, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Had my only panic attack, and the first panic attack was in that, before stepping into that courtroom. My stepsister yeah. literally had to hold me, so I hold the walker, and yeah. she's like, oh boy. <laughs> my mm-hmm. stepsister turns white as a ghost, and I walk in there. And literally say good afternoon, everyone, and sit down in my seat. Can can I ask? So, I, yeah, go ahead. The the story that you've told it it started because you were staying at your father's house. Yes. Be because because you needed the financial assistance, is what you said, right? I needed. No, I I needed. The financial assistance. I also needed the care too. Okay. Okay. But is there? I mean, forgive me. I'm not very skilled. I don't know much about. I mean, there's like an American Disabilities Act. I mean, yes. And I went to school without it. So okay. I have been mainstreamed all my life through preschool and um, through. All the way through elementary school, to college, through um, preschool, elementary school, high school, and college. I was basically made dreams, which means yeah. putting the classes with the other kids. The only accommodations sure. I had was a note taker, and when I was younger, one-on-one aid, and then, which my family paid for, 
And then um, when I was older, I got ex- extended time on test. And so, yes, there's Americans with Disabilities Act. I, in Colorado, by the time it was signed, I was, by the time it was signed in general, I was already in school. So I never had luxury okay. to the American Disabilities Act. In fact, I still don't. And I um, deal, Phoenix, Arizona is more prevalent to people with disabilities than the elderly than Aspen, Colorado was. Yeah. Aspen, Colorado is a mess when it comes Apparently. to disabilities. Okay. Then, then I, so I misunderstood that Americans with Disabilities Act. I thought that that, does it not provide, I mean, wasn't there some way you could get some help? You needed it, care, you needed some financial assistance, and then you ended up getting security. abused. Social security. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. That's, but then um, what, because like this, what, what happened to you, in my opinion, and I'm going to go off on a little bit of a soapbox here, well, but don't. in my opinion, <laughs> You ready? No, Here we care. go. What a huge fucking failure of the American like assist. How in the world did you end up like this, like swept under a rug? I mean, this is why you do what you do. I assume <laughs> because my um, I unfortunately was born in the generations of the I'm well. They were telling parents in the 60s. They were telling parents in the 70s. They were telling parents in the 80s. I am 87, so I'm at the tail end of that. To put their kids in homes, they will never talk, never walk, never speak, never do anything. And so my family, um, for those of you that um, follow the White House over the years, you know that... um, not Rosalind Carter. Oh, what's his name? He gave his daughter a lobotomy, and then help me out here, people. You're probably oh my going gosh. to be screaming at the podcast apps, screaming the name. Wait, g- gave I his daughter um, a lobotomy? Is that what yeah, I just heard? He gave his daughter a lobotomy because um, they thought she was dumb, basically. And so... Basically, they uh, put her locked her in the White House. My yeah. family still has, well, my family tried to put me in a group home, and they insisted yeah. that I go into a group home to take control of my finances and take control sure. of my fear. And we had many, 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 many conversations with this group home because the group home, all they wanted was the paycheck. And in the meantime, I knew I was moving down to Phoenix, Arizona, because when my aunt says, here, I found this house, I found this amazing development, and I... She goes, here, try this. So I'm the one that made the initial phone call to my condo complex now. And um, I'm the one that made the initial phone call. And a very nice real estate agent answers the phone. And I said, I'm looking at your website. What is the deal with this organization? And he goes, well, it's built for people with disabilities. I said, I have a disability. And the thing that got me is um, he said to me, when, how are you making it? How are you surviving in Aspen, Colorado? Mm-hmm. And I said, barely. I didn't tell him I was in a hotel room, but I said, barely. Sure. I can't find AIDS. It's a pandemic. And so I... Um, I said, send me your information, and I'll send it to my team. The next thing I know, I have a meeting with my team and my lawyer, my financial advisor, my um, stepmom, and her sister. And my um, fi- my aide wasn't there at the time. She, my lawyer, 
kicked it out and because uh, she knew I was moving. And mm-hmm. so by the end of that meeting, that was on a Friday. That was on a Thursday. We went home. Everything got put back into place. By the way, I had to call the cops as my boiler was breaking. I no, I had to call the cops because I was freezing. And of course, my stepmom said to my aide, "Put um, when I'm in this covers, everything will be fine." My aide thought that was fishy, and what my stepmom said, and I'm, she's like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. And so the day goes on, I get more cold, more cold, more cold. And for those of you that don't know, in Colorado, when your furnace goes out and the heat goes out, yeah, it's a shit show and a half because... The pipes freeze, and for those yeah. of you who are in the winter, I say it's, it's like down here when the AC goes out. Yeah, it's a, it's a major shit going on out when the AC yeah. goes out in Phoenix, Arizona, because yeah. the pipes won't freeze, but it gets swelled going hot. And so, sure. um, and if you've been in Phoenix, Arizona in the summer, you know what I'm talking about. 180 degrees in the summer. Yeah, sir. That's a little hot for me, and I yeah. do not used to the heat. But anyway, long before I realized my boiler was broken, I had to call the cops to say myself. I said, look, I am disabled. I live at this address. I need help. No one has come to turn my water back on. No one has come to turn my heat back on. I've sure. been getting um, alerts throughout the day, and my stepmom tried to call. They got no answer. So I landed up calling the non-emergency number, self-advocacy here, because my right. stepmom was still at work. And mm-hmm. so my aide goes out to the cops call. The, they weren't even to my room. But to my driveway, but the cops call the electric company and say, we have a very unique case here at one of the addresses. Please go and help. And so the electric company shows up and my aide greets the back door and it, and my aide goes, anything that she says, she's about to freeze herself after this. Well, on me, me, I was getting killed by carbon monoxide, too. And so the electric company tries to turn everything back on. They go, ma'am, you, and I'm sitting in my living room, and they go, ma'am, you need to get out of there now. We're shutting everything. We're not turning anything back on. Your boiler's leaking. It's leaking carbon monoxide. Oh, oh, geez. And in 24 hours, you would have been dead anyway. Yeah. So I I call my stepmom, and I said, we have a problem. And I explained the problem, and my stepmom goes, can I speak to the electric company? And so I hand my phone to the electric company because they're sure. still at my house taping everything up, putting red tape on don't touch and putting the yellow tape on the red, yellow tape on don't touch. The spoiler is about to go. And so my stepmom goes, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. And then starts yelling at the electric company. I'm because it's a speakerphone, and I'm listening to all this, and she goes, she, they hand back, they hand the phone back to me, and they, um, she goes, I want you to text message your team. Now, text messaging my team was the easy part, but you gotta remember, this um, electric outage happened in January, and sure. it wasn't even New Year's Eve yet, 
And so for those of you who Google Aspen, Colorado, you realize that Aspen, Colorado is a tourist destination. So the tourists were dealing with the outage, the locals were dealing with the outage, and right. of course, all the hotel rooms were booked. So right, we're like, right. and so my wife's like, oh boy, what do we do now? So she finds a hotel room, and my, I said to my team, including my stepmom on the text message, I said, look, here's a problem. I am in the house with my aide. They're about to shut everything down. They told me as a disabled person, you need to get out of it now. And my lawyer's like, I will, she saw the agency of the situation. I will do everything I can to find a hotel room. I will come and get you once I find a hotel room. And then my financial advisor goes, let me come over to the house and let me um, shut and burn things down so things don't go in the wrong direction. And sure. so he does that. My aide says, I'll pack a bag. I am helping my aide pack a bag in the, uh, in the middle of all this chaos. Um, my stepmom who's completely oblivious, who's at work, by the way. She's dealing with the same situation, but she doesn't sure. understand the emergency of my situation. She goes, is it safe to come home now? Well, like, no. Probably well, like, not, no. yeah. <laughs> no, it's not safe to come home now. So, um, long story short, I moved into a hotel room, and I knew so many people in that town that I got... On the phone, I explained the situation. The Pickham County service is actually paid for my hotel room okay. because they knew me and because they knew the situation. And I nicely explained to the woman on the phone who knew me um, what the situation was. She goes, look, I'll pay for your hotel room, which I was shocked by. And so that's what they do in a small town. Here in Phoenix, Arizona, that didn't happen, but mm. I was like, okay. So then I called the fire department and saying, this is what happened. I mean, space is. The fire department comes to make sure everything is not gone in the wrong direction. Everything is fine. We wait for a week in a hotel room. And in the meantime, as I'm sitting at my desk in a hotel room recording podcasts, my aunt Googled the Luna Zool where I'm at now. Here, here says, try this. I call the Phoenix phone number. By that um, Thursday, when I'm about to go home, my team decides to drive down here that Friday to the place on my behalf. Sure. To oh. the place on my behalf, and then um, show it to me via FaceTime, and and then luckily I trusted my lawyer at the time to let her pick my condo, right. and because I was in Aspen, not vaccinated, so she goes, "Don't you come down to think that if anything happens to you, I would literally." Die and so right. don't you coming down? So she was being protective of me, and she said, "I'll just show it to you by the FaceTime." And so basically, that's how we did it. In 24 hours, I bought a house in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow! Packed <laughs> up my van, my van with a duffel bag, my wheelchair, and a person who was my assistant. We barely knew each other, and we drove. 10 hours to think of Oh, my ago. gosh. And I'm in like, 24 hours? you did, Wow. I mean, it's hours. a quick turnaround. 10 <laughs> hours. And, yeah. But within 24 hours, I got a house in the total. Yeah. Six. That's stunning. And so I'm like, so I moved down here in 2021, okay. March of 2021. Okay. Yeah. And, and presumably life is at, at least life somewhat is less stressful. Better. 
I, okay, uh, good. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, Louisville is designed for people with disabilities. I'm yeah. the only one in here with cerebral palsy. And the rest are Downs and Downs autism and a rare genetic disorder. And mm-hmm. so, yeah. But my condo doesn't look like a disabled person. Well, my my may look like a disabled person lives there because there's a ramp at my front door. But they people understand I have a disability. But yeah, people sure. are amazed that I live on my own with um, aides that come in the morning, come in the afternoon to help me, and then I live on my own. Yeah. And I learned how to take the bus. And I learned how to function in the Phoenix, Arizona. But, it, I mean, <clears throat> it sounds like there was so much so much adversity, you know, in a couple of years there. I'm glad that, you know, things have been have pulled back together, if yeah. nothing else. Yeah. So. Because I made them pull back together. I yes. made it yes. pull back together. Right. Right. And I'm, I'm so happy to... I mean, to hear that story, this actually is what your, your memoir is about, right? The I, I about win. about my, now you're asking about my memoir, well, geez, yeah, but you're going deep. Um, my memoir is about my childhood. I wrote that okay. in 2010 after my mom right. died oh, right. to do a legacy towards her. And yeah. so I've written a couple books since and I'm actually... In the process of sending a book to my editor by the time this episode comes out, it should be edited uh, about cool. podcasting, how I do podcasting as a disabled woman, because people are asking me that now. And yeah. by the time this episode comes out, which will be summertime in May, I will be recovering from a back surgery. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be fun too. I'm sorry to yeah, mention that's, that. That's my. I opted into that because I talk about medical advocacy. I'll tell you that story quickly. When I, I knew there was something wrong with my back, so I made a commitment to myself, secretly, privately to myself. And I said, well, when I get to a state with better medical care, I didn't yeah. care where it was. I was planning to move to the East Coast where my family is and where my network is. I was planning to move to Florida, of all places. And so I, but I made a commitment to myself in looking for a house um, in Florida or what land i be Phoenix, Arizona, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to get my back fixed because I knew something was wrong with my back. So I go to my first scoliosis appointment. I have had a spinal fusion and rods in my back, screws in my back, and it failed. it failed, but at the time, they said, oh, you have a scoliosis. You're fine. You can just go out your mailing way. And I said, no, something is wrong with my back. I can feel it. I know it. And something is wrong with my back. I'm in chronic pain. Nine times out of ten, something is wrong with my back. I want x-rays. I sure. want the order for X-rays. Now that I'm down in Phoenix, Arizona, and establishing myself and becoming a Phoenix resident, I want the X-rays. And so they go, fine, we'll get you the orders, but you can go get the X-rays, come back and see us. Well, by the time I got the X-rays, and by the time they took a look, they go, oops, something is wrong with the back. Oh, I have geez. now which I won't have on February, on April 23rd, I have failed back surgery syndrome. And so this failed in 2006. No one told me. No one oh, shoot. gave up. 
who about yeah. my film back to the good system. They didn't even tell me I had nerve damage. I found that one trying to walk down a set of marble stairs at my grandmother's house in the Bahamas. I found out about them when I'm like, why can't my leg bend? Thank you very much. Yeah. And then I found out that I have nerve damage. They let my spine go dead for 20 minutes and also gave me Purple Fall in oh. Children Syndrome, which oh, gosh. for those of you that don't know what Purple Fall in Children Syndrome is, it's when your blood turns acidic under anesthesia. And for those of you that don't know what Purple Fall in Children Syndrome and why it's so serious, is it's because that's what Michael Jackson died of in his oh. own home. So I'm the youngest person to survive Pope Fall and Fusion Syndrome. Most people do not survive yeah. Pope Fall and Fusion Syndrome, let alone survive the six hour back surgery. Right. With the complications, well, uh, let, let alone have mobility after letting their spine go dead for 20 minutes. So yeah, yeah. a higher power was upstairs working right. magic. And so on the upper lane of day. So I spent three days in the ICU. That was oh, fun. Insurance had yeah. to be called daily on that one. And the insurance went, oh, she's fine. She doesn't need the ICU. My dad goes, number one, she's fighting for a wife. Number two, just Give her one more day in the ICU, I beg of sure. you, and then um, put her in a normal room, and then we'll take her home. And right. so on April 23rd, I'm having my back redone again. I opted into this, you guys. And so they said, for the first six weeks, you'll be regretting the year this year. And they told mm -hmm. me nervous damage is painful and nerve damage. And I they told me all about the electrodes. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. And I know that um, this recovery will not be easy and maybe not be fun. But I'm going to try and make it fun. And I know that um, people will be... Sending positive vibes and all that. And right, right. I will be listening to all the podcasts that I can to keep myself company. And, uh, um, yeah. Because, I mean, the you know, youngest person to survive the syndrome. Like, I almost want to say congratulations, but now you're looking at six weeks of, <laughs> like, much worse. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking at... You know, I mean... It's like it's hard to – it's one of those – it's like a left-handed compliment. Somebody says, yeah. you know, you're, yeah. you're really pretty for being as old as you are. And you go, Yeah, wait, exactly. What? Exactly. That wasn't cool. <laughs> yeah. So so can you – we're running a bit low on time. I, I wanted to ask, I mean, how can people um, – Engage more with the, with your story. Where's your? Oh, I mean, I've got some. Google things. my name. Google my name, and I know you will have my website in the show notes. A CEO with a disability, you guys. It can be found in Apple Podcasts. It can be found in every player under the sun, except for Google. Google Podcast is walking which, out the door, which and so just died. Yes. Podcast in Google. And so, except for Google, it can be found in every other podcast player. It can be played on the smart speakers, including Google's and Amazon's. And I'm careful not to say Amazon's name because I've learned that it will make Amazon go off if I say the name. <laughs> so, yeah, really? literally, it will. And it so, know. it will even make Amazon go off if you're listening to this podcast and a podcaster says her name too. I had that funny. happen too. And yeah. so I don't say her name. But it can my podcast could be found on all platforms, including you can stream it on small TVs and everywhere else. And we're about to start in YouTube music. So it can oh, right. by the 
time that this podcast goes out. It should be in the YouTube music, so you can stream it there and listen to it there. Although it doesn't capture the numbers, but that's okay. And so um, YouTube is a totally different beast from the East in itself. So people can Google my name or go to a CEO with a disability dot we believe dot com and okay. find my information there. They can also go to Facebook. They can also find my books on Amazon. If you type in I comma W I N, you can follow me on Amazon. In fact, when I publish new books, if you follow me, you will get a smart speaker notification and an email saying, oh, so you follow us, publish new work. So I would appreciate the follow on Amazon too, so you can keep up with my joy there. And yeah. It's all the things. Yeah, <laughs> You're it's all, all the things. Well, Wynn, thank you so much. Um, and so much story in, 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 you know, 30 years, right? I mean, I appreciate that you, that you, that you took all your time to talk with me today and, and give me so much of your story. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. And one thing I wanted to say for those of you who are still in the closet, I'm putting air quotes here for those who can't say. So for those of you that are still in the closet and haven't come out of the closet, as I say, I came out of the closet in 2019. As you know, I'm a big ally of the gays. I'm also gay, so I'm raising that rainbow flag every which way. I should get a rainbow flag on the back of my wheelchair at this point. But um, I am establishing myself in Phoenix. I haven't got to into the gay community in Phoenix yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. After my back surgery, yes, I will. In 2025, I've decided that 2025 is a year. But just Perfect. know that in the gay community, we all rally for each other along with disabled in the disabled community. We all rally for each other. So especially if you're gay and disabled, it's time to come out of the closet, put the rainbow flag on your shirt, put the rainbow flags on the back of your wheelchairs or your assistive devices and all your AAC devices, assistive communication devices. Put a rainbow sticker, I don't care. And just come out of the closet and know you are. I agree with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, well, with that, I do want to say thank you to all our listeners today. I am Amethyst Herrick. We're talking on Gender Identity Weekly with Wynn Charles. Thank you again, Wynn. Thank you. Thank you.